Hi, I'm Mark Lynch, Director of the Project on Middle East Political Science and the Institute for Middle East Studies at George Washington University. Welcome back to the POMEPS Conversations with leading scholars of the Middle East. Uh, with me today is Matt Bueller, uh, who is finishing his dissertation at the University of Texas, Austin, and will be beginning in the Department of Politics at the University of Tennessee next year. Uh, Matt just spent the last two years uh, doing extensive interviews and field work with uh, Islamists in North Africa. And um, Matt, welcome to GW. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here, Mark. So let's start with uh, with Morocco mm. um, and uh, the experience of the uh, of the PJD in government. Uh, t tell us, you know, what what did, what have you learned or what have you heard about how they got to power, what they're doing with power, and what it means for thinking about Islamists? Sure. Sure. Well, of course, the story of the PJD in Morocco is a long one, and uh, really, the party has always had a very uncomfortable relationship with the monarchy. The monarchy has always kept the the, the Islamists at kind of arm's length. You know, the, in uh, in the in the late 1990s, the early 1990s, they decided to let the Islamists into the political system after the tragic events of Algeria. They thought, oh, you know, it's better to have the Islamists in government than in the shadows and in the background. Uh, but they've always been in the opposition. Very, The regime has been very skeptical of the party. Um, but recently, you know, due to the, the Arab Spring, the, the Islamists kind of rose, uh, rode the discontent of the Arab Spring uh, in order to achieve their own electoral success. And now in government, they face a, a series of different challenges. The first being the fear of co-optation. You know, the regime has a very long history of controlling opposition parties through uh, through co-optation, through the Mahzan system, and there's there's a threat that maybe uh, the the PJD will accept the spoils of the office and go the same way as the Moroccan socialists. There's also a problem of the shadow government, this new parallel government that's developed within the king's palace. You know, there are there's basically you know, for example, there's a, an Islamist justice minister, minister, Mustafa Ramid, and there's an equal minister of justice or advisor of justice in, uh, in the palace. And there's an idea that maybe the regime is trying to preserve spheres of autonomy outside the elected government's uh, role. Certainly foreign dignitaries such as Hillary Clinton, when she visited Morocco, uh, chose to meet with the king's advisors rather than the elected government. Uh, and this is a problem for the PGAD. In the future, I think we'll need to see, uh, you know, if the party can maintain its institutions, maintain its independence, or over time, it's been it gets co-opted into the the rural clientelist system, uh, you know, that's been promoted by the Moroccan monarchy for for thousands of years. Really. So, so do you think that the PJD simply got bought off with empty mm -hmm. power? Sure. Uh, you know, empty power. It's really difficult. I think, you know. In comparison with other countries in in the region, I think political parties do have some say in governance in Morocco, and you know the PJD does have an ability to say shape some economic policies, but certain there are certainly certain red lines like the Western Sahara conflict, for example, um, you know things dealing with corruption that the PJD really can't ta tackle. So in empty power, maybe they can't take on all the issues they want to address, like you said. But certainly, some things to make their social constituents happy, I think they can address in terms of development, especially in medium-sized impoverished cities where the Islamists have historically done well, such as Tetuan and Kanetra. So what have they done? I mean, many people yeah. think that Islamists will come in and yeah. focus on, on religious and cultural issues, right. you know, right. segregating the schools and, and right. that sort of thing. And others think that they'll come and they'll focus on the economy and, mm -hmm. and building up uh, you know, a, a base that way. What is your accounting of what the PJD has done mm -hmm. in government? What does it suggest about their priorities? Well, thus far, you know, to be quite honest, there the PJD is really just handling the various economic problems that Morocco has inherited uh, from the previous El Fessi administration. So there's been a pressure by the regime's economic advisors to cut certain subsidies uh, in in the national budget to equalize uh, or, or erase the budget deficit. And these have to do with petrol, um, bread, and other staple food items. And so the, they've asked the PJD to make these cuts. The PJD has said, yes, we're going to do it, but we want targeted reforms. In other words, we want these subsidies, we want to remain, we want to keep subsidies for, um, you know, poorer citizens, but for citizens that are wealthier, we want to figure out ways to kind of close these loopholes and bring in more money mm -hmm. to equalize the budget. In terms of the, the various social issues, the PJD hasn't changed anything. There's been no 
new restrictions on dress of, of foreigners or locals on beaches. There's no been no new laws concerning alcohol distribution. Morocco is very famous for even during Ramadan periods, uh, even when the, the socialists were in power, there's a restriction of the sale of alcohol, and I suspect that that will continue into the future. We could see some more conservative social policies than we've seen in the past, more restrictions on alcohol for Moroccans and not for foreigners, but uh, I think only time will tell what's going to happen with that. Is there, is there any sign of discontent uh, in their base mm -hmm. over their inability to pursue more Islamic legislation? Hmm. That's a good question. I haven't seen I haven't seen anything thus far. I mean, in some ways, I think that the base is still trying to come to grips with this important monumental change. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, you know, the elections were in two thousand eleven, November two thousand eleven, so we're into two thousand thirteen now. But I think the, they're still trying to figure out what exactly the PJD can and can't do uh, relative to the shadow government, the power of the palace, and you know what kind of what kind of change they really can implement over time. Now, in the broader sphere of Moroccan Islamism, uh, many people are very interested in, in you know, the death uh, of Sheikh Yassin sure. and what this will do to the Abdul al Hassan movement. Sure. And what is your read of the, of the broader mm -hmm. uh, scope or span of, uh, of Moroccan Islamism now? Sure. Well, so people have, for a long time, scholars of Middle East politics, have spoken about these two different Islamist groups in Morocco, al Abdul Ihsan, or the Justice and Charity Movement, and the PJD. Uh, now, I think most of this, over, you know, from the past, there was kind of a consensus that al-Adl al-Hassan was stronger than the PJD. But I think most of this research is based from the early 1990s, and it might be out of date. We're really 20 years past these really important Mudawna debates when al-Adl al-Hassan really asserted its street presence. And right now, I think in some ways the organization has deteriorated over time, certainly with the death of Sheikh Yassin. The turnout towards his funeral, funeral was not nearly as big as the street protests. You know, al-Adl al-Hassan during the Arab Spring uprisings really didn't have uh, didn't, you know, if you looked at the protests, I went to several of the protests to observe, they never had more than 10 or 15 percent of the general population of pro protests allied with al Abdul Hassan. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, I think that there's been a shift in terms of the, uh, of the supporters from al Abdul Hassan to the PJD, realizing that it is a serious Islamist party. It does want to implement democracy uh, through gradual participation in the system, and it also wants to implement, uh, you know, more conservative social policy. Now, what does this mean about Al Abdul Hassan in the future? Well, there's definitely a leadership crisis. Nadia Yassin has tried to take the reins of that organization, but in some, in some ways, she's been less successful, maybe than than her father. And I think we'll just need to see in the future what the long-term outcome will be. Now, let me ask you: uh, your dissertation, uh, mm -hmm. unusually for Middle East studies, <laughs> includes a Mauritania yeah. as a case study. Yeah. Let's just talk about that real sure. quickly. You know, t tell us what do you think is interesting about Mauritania? Why did you include it sure. in in your comparison, and what yeah. did you learn from doing so? Sure, uh, that's a really good question, Mark. Thank you. Uh, the first, no, no, no one studies Mauritania. So. <laughs> Master with first, Daddy, this one is for you. <laughs> the first thing is that I would say that. In terms of Mauritanian domestic politics, only like two or three books have been written on, on the country in the last 20 or 30 years, which to me is a pretty big gap. I mean, this is a historical area of North Africa that hasn't been, hasn't been touched. I mean, practically, I, incurred, I included it in my dissertation because it's a very interesting comparative case. You know, if you have Tunisia as a dominant presidential system, uh, Morocco, which is a monarchy, and uh, Mauritania, Mauritania, which is really a military junta, you might say. Also, they have a dominant party of sorts, but it's a military junta. Yet the, the strategies of control, of co-optation, are similar in both Morocco and Mauritania, mm -hmm. even though their regime types differ. So in, uh, you know, why, you know, sometimes you speak about how uh, the Moroccan socialists have been co-opted in Morocco. Well, what you see in Mauritania is that uh, the Islamist party, at Tawassal, has been co-opted by that regime. In fact, at one point, the Islamist opposition party there had, had broken its alliance with other secular opposition parties to, in fact, enter into an alliance with uh, Mauritania's regime party, the Union for the Republic Party, which is led by uh, Mohamed Abdelaziz, the president of Mauritania and the, the coup leader. 
So you have the coup, you have elections, you have a counter coup. Mm -hmm. uh, how much has changed? In, is this just surface or have fundamental things changed in Mauritanian politics? Well, I think that coups in, in, uh, in Mauritanian politics are kind of like the rings. They come and go, you know, quite frankly, every two or three years. Right. But uh, certainly there's a degree of openness and participation in the system that there wasn't in, in the previous era with the previous dictator, Taya. So, so do you or do you not see a Mauritanian spring on the horizon? Well, they certainly attempted to, to have one. There was the, you know, in Morocco, it's very interesting because Morocco and Mauritania are so different. But, you know, in Morocco, you had a February 20th movement. In Mauritania, you had a February 25th movement, which had a similar kind of demand, similar social constituency of young leftist activists. Um, the thing about Mauritania, in some ways, it has a history similar to Algeria in the sense that it had a very traumatic um, ethnic conflict in the 1980s and so people there are a little bit more hesitant about change a little bit you know maybe less willing to take to the streets than than uh, citizens of other Arab countries um, well great that's really interesting um, so thank you I'm Matt Bueller University of Texas soon to be University of Tennessee thanks for joining us thank you